we go. All right. This is our 60-second warning-ish um, historical foundation for some of the things we want to talk about. But then I like to do discussion. So we'll pop right over and start discussing. Good. Fantastic. Well, it is officially on my clock, 9 a.m. So I will get the ball rolling. I think more folks will start kind of trickling in as, the, um, as we get into the discussion. So good morning, everyone. My name is Leah Case. Uh, the CJ that is with me is my baby Charlotte. She is mobile, but she will undoubtedly be back in here during the course of the discussion. So you may see her up on the screen and waving uh, and saying milk. Uh, so today, as we do our chalice lighting before we get started, I just uh, I think it's fun to let everyone know that today is the day of the dude. Uh, March 6th is the day The Big Lebowski was released, and Dudism has uh, spread since that release. Dudism has its roots in, in Taoism, and uh, there are several influential writers in the Dudism movement, including uh, today I will be reading Revolutionary Letter Number 2 by Diane de Prima. Um, she is a beat poet, or was a beat poet. She passed away in 2020. So as we light our chalice, here are our words today. The value of an individual life, a credo they taught us to instill fear and inaction, you only live once. A fog on our eyes, we are endless as the sea, not separate. We die a million times a day. We are born a million times. Each breath, life and death, get up, put on your shoes, get started, someone will finish. Tribe, an organism, one flesh, breathing joy as the stars breathe destiny down on us. Get going, join hands, see to business. Thousands of sons will see to it when you fall, you will grow a thousand times in the bellies of your sister. That was revolutionary letter number two by Diane de Prima. As we light our chalice. So now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Sandra Cosgrove here in the corner of my screen. Uh, she is the past president of the League of Women Voters of Nevada, the vice chair of the Nevada Advisory Committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights, a city of Las Vegas historic preservation commissioner, a board member of the ACLU Nevada, and a board member of the Nevada Women in Trades. She is currently the executive director and chair of the board for Vote Nevada. She received her PhD in history at UNLV and is professor of history at the College of Southern Nevada, where her focus is the American West, Native American studies, and Latin America. She also teaches Latin American studies at UNLV. Thank you for joining us this morning, Sandra. All right, thank you. I think my goal in life is to actually be on every board that exists in Nevada. I'm getting close. <laughs> You're in the right place. We do love a good committee and board in, in this fellowship. Okay, so um, thank you so much for inviting me to share some time with you today to talk about one of my most favorite topics, and that is voting. What I want to do is um, I'm going to do a brief PowerPoint presentation, kind of lay out some historical foundation about voting rights and how it blends into American history and how it blends into other types of rights. As I'm going through the PowerPoint presentation, if you have a question or something that you would like to talk about, if you can put that over in the chat. That way, when I'm done with the PowerPoint presentation, I'll be able to do, you know, stop sharing my screen and I'll be able to see you. Because I, I like to be able to see people's faces, which is, you know, one of the reasons I like Zoom. But I do know, because I'm one of those people who has a question, I think, oh, I'll remember it at the end of the presentation and then I forget. So if you put it over in the chat, that way we don't forget anything and I can go down and answer them as we're going through the discussion. So I am gonna go ahead and do a share screen now. Okay. All right, and then I'm going to go ahead and hide this like that. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and start this. There we go. Okay, as Leah said, um, one of the hats that I wear is a executive director for a small nonprofit called Vote Nevada. What Vote Nevada is, is it's basically our tagline is solving problems through civics. Because what I find as a history professor at the College of Southern Nevada is that oftentimes my students will ask me questions about 
Well, you know, if I was going to open a business, how would I even know where to file a business license? Or if I wanted to get involved with what's going on with K-12 education, how do I figure out who does what? Is it the legislature, the governor? I don't know where to start. And so I started realizing that a lot of people are, are new to Nevada, and sometimes people just don't really interface with the government very much, and they don't know basic processes. They don't know where to start. And to me, it's important that people feel not only enfranchised to vote, and, and voting is really important, but also feel like they have the power to do advocacy with the legislature or to contact the governor's office or to go to a school board meeting. And really, if people feel empowered to do those things, that's when we really get back to kind of this foundation of we the people. And it's not just the political parties or just elected officials that, that manage things. We actually have a voice. So I want to talk about voting elections and some of our other civil rights that are connected to it. Um, so Vote Nevada, we have a website, a blog, uh, email address, and we're on social media. Okay, move forward. Okay, so now I'm going to do to you what I do to my students. I'm going to show you an image that's going to make you go, wait, what? Why is she showing me this? What, what is she doing here? Uh, most Americans, if you uh, know anything about American history, starting in probably the first grade, but definitely by the time you've graduated high school or college, recognize this as the uh, Boston Tea Party. And I, I spend a lot of time on this with my students because there's a lot of things that were happening at the Boston Tea Party that most people do not know because of the way we teach American history. So if I ask my students and I say, what is this? They, they'll say, oh, well, that's the Boston Tea Party. And I'll say, well, wh what are they, what are the people doing here? And they'll say, oh, that's the colonists. They were protesting against taxes on tea. They had had it with taxes. And so they dress up as Native Americans to disguise themselves. And then they sneak onto this boat and they throw in the tea in the harbor. And I say, okay, that's a nice story, but that's not actually the truth. There's so much more that was going on here. And so with the Boston Tea Party, notice all the people who are on the dock who are cheering them on. This meant they knew this was going to happen. This was something that had been planned. And it had been planned. It had been planned by um, Sam Adams and John Hancock and some of the founders of our country, but they were not actually allowed to participate. It had to be average citizens who had lost the right to vote or to participate um, in Boston politics. Because in English history and English political tradition, there was this thing known as mobbing. And mobbing was an, an actual legal thing you could do if you did not have the right to vote. And so what, what in English history or in English society is what they would say is if you didn't have the right to vote, we didn't want to give you the right to vote, but we did want you to, to have the ability to at least express yourself politically, to kind of act out if you were upset. So in mobbing, you would be able to, if you had a clear purpose, there was some injustice that you, you could identify. If you gathered up other people who had lost the right to vote, and it was usually men, but women could do it too, you would then go and you would go to where the injustice was happening. And then you could, in the course of writing this social injustice, destroy property. If you could connect it to the social injustice, you could destroy property. But the number one rule is, is you never hurt people. If you hurt people, then that was an illegal act and you would be arrested. But this was a substitute for voting. And, and the English didn't want to extend voting rights. And so they were allowing kind of average citizens to sometimes be able to express themselves, to get to kind of work it out of their system in a way that would connect you know, people who were in parliament with the people who were kind of at the, at the lower rungs of society who were experiencing some type of injustice. So this is what's happening at the Boston Tea Party. Now, the injustice that they are protesting was not taxes. It was not taxes. It was actually a lack of fair representation. That the colonists, especially in Boston, had been complaining about taxes, but what they were complaining about is they said, we don't have fair representation in parliament. And because we don't have fair representation, we're shut out of any of the discussions about taxes. And so we don't think the taxes are fair. Give us fair representation so that we can elect people, vote for people to go from the colonies to parliament, speak for us, have a voice, and then if taxes pass, we'll think that they're fair. And so this is a protest about fair representation, not, a, not really a protest about taxes. The taxes on tea had not gone up under the Tea Act. And the reason that they are dressed as Native Americans is not because they thought they were disguising themselves. You can see their faces. You know it was Bob and Frank. They're not, you're, not, you're not thinking it's somebody else. Symbolically, what they're doing is in Boston especially, they're saying, we're not Englishmen anymore. We're now Native Americans. We're ready to go independent. We're ready to separate. And so the people on the dock knew that this mobbing action was going to happen. And so they are there to cheer it on. 
something that's not in this picture that we know from newspaper accounts and letters that were written is that there were British man of war. There were naval vessels in that harbor when this was happening, but they did not act to arrest these, these colonists because they were following the rules of mobbing. It was political participation if you did not have the right to vote. So this was something that was, was front and center in the minds of uh, the founders who came from Boston, from New York, from Virginia, that the colonists were gonna go into our new nation with a tradition of being able to act out if they did not have the right to vote. And so they're gonna to have to confront that pretty quick after the American Revolution ends. So when you look at the Boston Tea Party, they're protesting the Tea Act. It was the East India Company was, was, had, was given a monopoly on being able to bring tea into the, the harbors where they were gonna cut out the wholesalers. They were cutting out the middlemen, which was a threat to colonial merchants and their pocketbooks. That's what they're really protesting. And they were engaging in this mobbing action to protest against injustice they were following these rules of clear purpose, you know, no threats against per, uh, persons. And so they're, they're dressing up as Native Americans saying, we're ready to go, we're ready to separate, we're ready to, to have some type of a new country where we have fair representation. And so again, don't fixate on taxes because that's a story we tell ourselves because today we are argue about taxes so much. What they're really arguing about was this idea of, did they wanna accept virtual representation or were they willing to go independent to receive direct representation in a body where they could vote for somebody to go in and represent them. Voting rights were not discussed at this time period. Everybody was really focused on this idea of fair representation, but in the background, obviously they are talking about voting rights because to have fair representation, the body that's making decisions about taxes and education and all the important things, in order to have fair representation, you have to have voting rights and they have to be protected. So they go together. You have to talk about one if you're talking about the other. And unfortunately today in our society, we talk a lot about voting rights, but we don't talk about the right of fair representation and we need to get back to it. And even there's, there's stories about fair representation in the news today, but people are not saying it that way. So I wanna talk about the way we're talking about fair representation so that we can wed them back together. So when we come out of the uh, American War for Independence or the American Revolution, you've got a radicalized population. You've got a population who's now been told not only that they have the power to decide what type of government they want, but you've now radicalized them with weapons. You've taught them how to fight injustice with weapons. And so the founders of this country, no matter what they thought they were doing and what they thought they were going to do once we became independent, the, the people who fight the war are quickly gonna seize that initiative to seize the agenda. And so you've got, especially in the North, um, the people who fought the war, the average man, the Minuteman who fought the war saying to the people who are founding this country, to the elite, is that you are, you've made promises to us about what type of nation we're going to be. You know, we had this argument with parliament. We said we have grievances against parliament because they didn't do certain things that we believed a government should do. And so we expect the new government in this country are gonna do those things. The founders of this country try and kind of stomp on the brakes a little bit to say, okay, well, let's, let's take it slowly. Let's kind of figure out what we're doing. You know, we can take our time now. It doesn't need to be rushed. And in the South, that, that argument holds sway because in the South, the status quo kind of takes over. Having said that, there's a lot of men in the South who had not had the right to vote in the colonial, in, in the colonies, who do get the right to vote because now they're able to expand out known property. And so there's a lot of average men in the South, white men who do get the right to vote, but they're not really voting for anything radical. They still vote for the plan to relate to be in control of things. They still kind of feel that slavery as an economic system is the way for them to maintain their status and wealth. So you don't see a lot of change happening in the South. In the North, however, you've got threats of revolution continuing. And so you're gonna see in the state constitutions, that are written in the Northern states as soon as we become independent. And that's why there's a lag time between the winning, the, you know, the signing of the, the Treaty of Paris that ends the Revolutionary War and the writing of the federal constitution because everybody rushes back to their state to write a state constitution to really enshrine on a piece of paper what they think the revolution was about. So in the North, you're gonna see these very, very radical views of democracy and voting pop up. 
In New Jersey, for a while, women, uh, white women who, who owned property were actually given the right to vote. It gets rescinded and pulled back. But there was this idea that we just had a revolution and we're going to go go to town and we're going to write and ensconce these things in our state constitutions. Now, in England, it was really easy to um, restrict voting rights and to restrict representation just by saying you have to own property in order to be able to participate in politics. That's not going to be exclusionary here in this new country, because once the British leave, there's going to be an opening of the West and pretty much every white man that wants to own property is going to be able to do so. And so immediately there's going to be this idea that white men who own property um, are going to be able to participate in politics. It needs to be expanded. We need to decide how that's going to look. But by the time you get to the 1830s, there are going to be other groups besides white men who own property who are going to start saying, especially white, white women, saying, okay, well, what about us? We participated in, in the revolution. You know, we're carrying on these, uh, these ideals of republicanism. Why aren't we allowed to vote? I thought that was kind of what the revolution was about. So when Andrew Jackson is president in the 1830s, and he's someone that has a Western background, he doesn't come from the elite, he's not gonna have a ready-made base of people to support. He wants more people to have the right to vote because he thinks if he gives it to them, they're gonna vote for him and he's right. So he is very much a populist when he's talking about expanding voting rights. He never goes so far to actually endorse get women having the right to vote, but he definitely invites women into public spaces to talk about politics. And so it's at this point in the 1830s that you see the modern political party starting to develop. Because this is where the people who are kind of controlling the levers of political power start to say, we're really seeing momentum for more and more people wanting the right to vote and wanting their right to vote to being protected. We need to start organizing them and convincing them to vote for the folks that are already in power. We don't want things to get out of control and have 15 political parties and have people like Andrew Jackson popping up all over the place saying that they have a right to represent the people. And so this is where you start to see this two party system that we know today, the modern political party really start to take shape is in the 1830s and 40s, where people are thinking about organizing voting blocks. People are thinking about transactional voting. Your candidate needs to be out on the on the voting trail, out on the election trail asking voters what they want and promising it to them and saying, if you vote for me, I'm going to represent you and what you just said to me. And if I don't do it, you're going to be able to vote me out. And so voting and this idea that people should be partic participating in elections, even if you don't have the right to vote, really starts to take on this everybody should do it mentality by the time we get to the 1840s. Now, still, as we move along, there are going to be groups who feel like they're excluded because they lack voting rights, they lack power, um, they lack an ability to affect change. And so really we, it's still kind of white men who are able to do all of these things. So other people as they, again, are participating with modern politics and modern parties are going to want to see their right to vote represented here because it's not represented there and they want it represented there to make sure that they have the right to vote, the right to participate and that right to fair representation. The problem is, is that U.S. Constitution, when it is written, says nothing about voting. And again, the reason is, is because the states had already written state constitutions, but by the time we get to that, the federal constitution being written. And so when they're meeting in Philadelphia and they're scratching their heads, figuring out how do we write voting rights into this federal document to encompass what all the states are doing, and they just decide they can't. And so that this is where in the, in the U.S., politically, the states are given the power to control elections and to control voting. And, and it's done this way because we were just way too diverse and there was no way to represent, you know, the very states that had gone very liberal and then the Southern states that were very conservative in one document. And they needed this document to be ratified. So in the, the actual federal constitution as originally written, there's not really anything we can point to to say, oh, look, here's where I have the right to vote. Or, oh, look, this is where I get the right to fair representation. Where we're going to have that discussion is going to be in the amendments. And, and we start amending the Constitution right after it's ratified, because again, the people in the North look at the body of the Constitution and they're like, whoa, wait a minute, this is a lot of power. And I don't see any of the protections that we've written into my state Constitution. I, I don't, I, there's no way I'm going to give the federal government this much power without a Bill of Rights. And so the Bill of Rights immediately gets added 
because there's this kind of lingering distrust of strong government based on what we had done in the American Revolution. And the Bill of Rights doesn't really say a whole lot about voting or participating in government, but it starts to establish this idea is that I as an individual have rights. And my rights are in relationship to my state government and my state constitution and to the federal government in the federal constitution. This idea that I have rights as a person. And so when you look at the amendments that come from 11 to 27, this is where the revolution, when you're looking at individual rights um, related to voting and representation, uh, enter into the constitution so that I can sue in court or I can point to a document to say, this is where I get my right to vote. This is where I get my right um, to be fairly represented. And I always tell my student, my students, if you wanna look at the granddaddy of all constitutional amendments, that really is the wellspring of civil rights, it's the 14th amendment that was written after the civil war. So we write the 13th amendment, we get rid of slavery. We finally say, that's it. We're not having slavery anymore. It's in the constitution. But then in the 14th Amendment, we're having to com completely reconceptualize what the country is supposed to be. And so this is where we have birthright citizenship to make sure emancipated slaves are once and for all considered citizens. And this strikes down the Dred Scott Supreme Court ruling. But it also does something else. It also puts the federal government in charge of enforcing the Bill of Rights at the state level. And so it talks about that no state can deprive a person of life, liberty, um, property, or due process of law. Can't deny a person within his jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And that is so important. And again, it says I as an individual have equal protection of the laws. So what does that mean if I don't have the right to vote? What does that mean if I don't have the right to fair representation? And so since the, the we you know, passed the 14th Amendment and added it to the Constitution in 1868, We've added other amendments where we, where we clarify the right to vote, where we clarify this, this idea of fair representation. And so from the 14th Amendment forward, when we talk about voting rights, we're oftentimes talking about an individual's power, my power in society to affect education policy, public accommodations, affordable housing, um, business policy, if I'm gonna get a license for business, consumption, do I pay a tax, credit, is someone allowed to, to uh, um, apply very high interest rates? Even, even, you know, we talk about the spoils of war, we talk the spoils in politics, being able to get a government job, being able to get a contract, being able to tap into tax revenue. Right now, foreign affairs, that each one of us feels like our voice should be heard, not just on trade, but militarism. What are we going to do about Russia and the Ukraine? Every person right now, especially with social media, feels like they should be able to have their voice heard, is gonna reach out to, to their elected leaders. But then the thing that we run into that's going to cause problems over and over, and this is why we have to keep amending the federal constitution and passing laws, is as more people start to participate, all of our very, very rich diversity starts to, be, starts to impact this idea of power and decisions that we're making. Because when we, get to, when we get diversity in our political systems, now we start talking about a redistribution of resources, a redistribution of control and decision making. Women are going to, white women especially, are going to show up first and want that. But then it's going to be, you know, men of color. It's going to be women of color. It's going to be immigrants are going to start showing up and saying, the way things are now really does not give me power, does not get my voice heard. We need to start talking about changing things, maybe dismantling inequity, uh, dismantling barriers to advancement, dismantling a racial caste system. But more and more people, as they demand a seat at the table and they demand this right to have power, this is where you're gonna see it by the time we get to the 1950s and 60s, just overt voter suppression, um, barriers to voter registration, barriers that include killing people in the deep South, but barriers such as literacy tax or a poll tax, um, barriers to voting, making sure even if you have the right to vote, you have to stand in line seven hours and you're not gonna be able to, to vote, making sure that we have inefficient voting mechanisms that don't count people's votes in some areas, uh, more than they count people's votes in other areas. But when we talk about voter suppression, we also need to talk about something else that's in the news a lot, and that is gerrymandering. We need to talk about redistricting, because if you are living in a, a highly gerrymandered district, it's voter suppression. If you are living in a highly Democratic or a highly Republic district, you, you can vote all you want. It's not going to make any difference. It, you have been rigged into a map that is going to take away your power. You might be able to vote, but your power to be able to have a say is completely diluted. And so to me, the discussions that we're having right now 
on the one hand, voter suppression, but then also on the other hand, all the lawsuits about gerrymandering, those two things go together and we have to talk about them together. Because if you're not also dealing with redistricting um, problems, you're not really then addressing voter suppression because you can have the best voter laws on the books. If you have gerrymandering, you're still going to have inefficient voting and you're going to be diluting people's power. So when we're protecting democracy, voting in elections are extremely important. Access, clarity, funding, making sure it's easy for people to vote, making sure it's secure, making sure our voting machines are encrypted, that we have security updates, that our voter registration rolls are being kept in a secure way. But we also need to say governance needs to be transparent. We need to have public access so people feel represented. We need accountability. I need, we need to be able to say, if you don't do your job as an elected official, we, feel, we should feel like we can vote you out. Fair redistricting, making sure that people can run ballot questions in every state if they're having problems and they don't have fair representation. So that initiative, the referendum and the recall, which we are very lucky that we have in Nevada. Though all these things together go towards protecting democracy, and so if we're only maybe talking about voter suppression or we're only maybe you know, a little bit talking about security of elections and we're not talking about all these other things, then, then our democracy is not going to be protected. It's not going to give people that power that they need to be able to come to the table and to ask for redistribution or to an ask for a way to, to, to rewrite the way we do education or to rewrite the way we, we do tax policy. And so I'm gonna go ahead and stop there and stop sharing so I can come back over and see everybody. And then I'll go over uh, to the chat first. And then if we want to, we can raise hands or however you do questions. Okay. Okay, so Leah did a question. Um, what message have you found most powerful in explaining why redistricting is so important to an individual? So this is the reason, um, I did this, this presentation for today, because what I'll say to people is they'll say, is gerrymandering, is redistricting, should I care? I mean, it seems like there's, everybody's yelling at each other. I don't know what to do. And I say to them, do you know what the Boston Tea Party is? And again, then they look at me and go, yes. And why are you asking me about that? But then I say, well, the Boston Tea Party was about fair representation. Remember, no taxation without representation. And so we, we focused on that taxation part, but they were really mad about representation. And so redistricting is, is your individual right to be heard, to be seen, to have power. You know, if you're upset about education, you gotta be living, you gotta have good maps to make sure that whoever you're electing feels like they're gonna have to be accountable to you. And so I, I always just start out with that kind of, and I do this with my students. I'll do like a non sequitur and they'll go, wait, what? why are you showing me that picture? I'm like, oh, thank you. Now I have your attention. Now you're paying attention to me. And then now we can kind of, you know, string out where I'm getting from this picture to something else. But we fought a revolution. We became an independent country because the founders of this country were mad that they weren't fairly represented. And then from there, they say that leads to unfair taxation. But we fought over fair representation, yet we don't talk about it as much as what we talk about voting. To me, they have to go together. So thank, thank you for asking me that. So there's a book called The Road to Mobocracy. That is probably the best book ever to talk about what mobbing actually was and why the founders of this country said, please stop mobbing and do more voting because the mob started attacking them. And so once it was you know, the mob attacking them, then they're like, well, maybe we'll just give people the right to vote so they'll stop you know, protesting in the street and destroying property. But The Road to Mobocracy is, is probably one of the best books that have been, has been written about that. Yep, right there. It's a really good book. Any other uh, people want to raise hands or um, call out, turn their camera on to ask questions? I think Bob has a question, but it, it came just to me. Is that correct, Bob? Was that meant to go to everybody? Yeah, because I don't see it. Do you want to unmute Bob and just ask the question? Uh, okay, protecting democracy is so vague that it's hard to say what we need to protect. Uh, how about something like protecting self-rule? Self-rule is good, but we're what we're but we're doing representative self-rule. So we're picking we're we're picking people that we think are going to be good at, at representing us. So we we need to decide what we want to do for self-rule. But then there the point where all the 
funny business happens is with us just picking people to represent us. Because if you're doing voter suppression, then you're not being given the right to pick somebody to, to represent you. But also if you're not um, giving people good fair district maps, then you're also not really giving a person to pick. You know, if, if I think Leah is really gonna go fight for me, but I'm living in a gerrymandered district and there's no way for Leah to get elected, I can keep voting for her over and over and I can't ever get her elected. And then I don't have self-rule. I'm just gonna be frustrated. And I think that's one reason that a lot of times people stop voting in this country is they, they just like Bob said, you know, that they're thinking, what am I doing? I'm protecting democracy, but I keep voting and nothing changes or I keep voting and my person never gets elected. And, and maybe they don't know about ballot questions or, or things like that. Because ballot questions, that definitely is self-rule. Um, is it Gia? Gaia. Gaia, okay. Um, you have a question? Yeah, well, this is kind of jumping. I just want to be sure this gets addressed. And if you want to address it later, that's fine. Okay. But you are probably aware that in Washoe County, our right to vote is going to be greatly attacked. And a bunch of us people, this particular forum is so timely. Um, a bunch of the people here and other congregants will be going to the commissioner's meeting, which is uh, two weeks from Tuesday. It's last Tuesday of the month, for those who don't know that. Right. But anyhow, what, I don't know how much you know or how much we have yeah. to fill you in, but- I read help it. Out so we can really be smart when we're up there telling the commissioners why they have to turn down this resolution. Right. Um, and, I, and I think the resolution has now changed a little bit because at first it was saying they wanted the, the National Guard to be at the polling locations. Now they're saying um, sheriff's deputies. So what's happening right now is the legal counsel for your county commission is doing his or her job. I think it's a him and using procedure and process to control something like this. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was not heard the first time. And so these types of things are really emotional because they hit at the heart of protecting democracy because we feel like democracy is being attacked. But you have to take a breath, take a deep breath, you know, try to, try to be calm. And first of all, say, is this person following the right process and procedure? If you can stop it there, do it that way. So even before you get to the point where you're arguing about what's actually in that proposal, ask yourself, is it following process? Is it following procedure? Because a lot of times you can stop things right there because a lot of times people who are doing those things aren't following process. Right now, I know at least what they've said is that the reason that they backed off is to have everything reviewed to be sure everything is legal. They're looking at the yes. um, financial, whatever of it. So they're, they're doing that right now. That's yes. not something we can do, but we will be there in two weeks. Right. And so and so I always tell people, um, if if the people who are in charge of process, policy, procedure and legality have not engaged, encourage them to engage. In this case, that is happening. So that's that's the first thing that you always should say. Are they following process? Are they following procedure? If if you can say yes, then say, is it legal? And then that's when you're going to want to bring in an attorney, general counsel, someone who knows uh, voting and election laws to go over it with a fine tooth comb and to find every instance where it might be a violation of state or federal law. If, if you can find a violation of state or federal law, this is where you can also say, you know, we can't um, vote on something that's illegal. You're gonna have to go back and you're gonna have to be in compliance. And so I'm imagining you're gonna see a couple of rounds of this because you can't intimidate people at a polling location that violates the Voting Rights Act. I can tell you right now, that's yeah. gonna get struck down. That is supposedly also what they are looking at, the legality of each of these various 20 parts of the resolution. That yes. also is being looked at in this time. So, so once they get past, um, it's following procedures, following policy, everything that's illegal has been taken out, it's probably gonna be watered down quite a bit. It's gonna be much more narrow. narrow. So that's where you're gonna, when you go to, to do public comment, I think the mistake I see people make is instead of, uh, referencing history instead of citing um, a, a Nevada revised statute or instead of citing historical precedent. Sometimes people get, just get very emotional and then it just ends up two emotional people screaming at each other. Try not to do that because then you're starting, you're starting to engage in, in logical fallacies. Once you make it about people and you're doing ad hominem attacks, then you're just, then that's, that's a logical fallacy. 
try to really, really focus on what is being said in whatever, it, you know, the pared down regulation and try to say, is this a problem? This looks like a solution to a problem that doesn't happen here. So you're saying we need to have law enforcement at the polling locations. Why? Can you, can, I need to see evidence that that's actually a problem that needs to be fixed. And so the way I would address it is I would go step by step every single change that, that person's trying to make. And I would say, I would be willing to support these things if you sh could show me hard evidence that these are actually problems that need a solution. Because I promise you what's gonna happen is they're not gonna have examples of actual problems that need a solution. And sometimes that's what we do with ballot questions as well. People seem to be solving a problem that does not exist. And so if you ask them, I need to have you concretely show me the voter fraud. I need to have you concretely show me, you know, when somebody showed up to a ballot location and was not allowed to vote, was able to vote. I need to have concrete examples of this because until then, I don't think we're actually solving any problems. And based on the amount of money that you want to spend, I don't think that's a good um, uh, allocation of taxpayer resources. But, I, but I, I understand how emotional these things get because it's an attack against democracy. And we all feel that in our hearts when that happens. But I also wanna say this, um, in the last two um, legislative sessions in Nevada, we passed a lot of changes to our voter registration and election processes. I have been working on, on voter registration and election processes since the early 1990s. Um, I worked with Dean Heller when he was the Secretary of State because I was with League of Women Voters. Best practices for doing any types of changes to voter registration and election processes is to do them not more than maybe two at a time and do a slow rollout so if there's any glitches or problems, they can get fixed quickly and that people have a chance to understand them and feel comfortable with them before you do another change. The problem we're facing right now is that under pandemic conditions, we had to change almost all of our election processes. Um, we needed to go to all mail-in balloting. We needed to do um, make sure that we were doing signature verification in a different way. And so when you make a lot of changes, in a short period of time and people get confused, they, they use their confusion to say that something bad has happened. So instead of just saying things got chaotic and we just had to make a lot of changes, they start to feel that that confusion is done on purpose to do something illegal. And so the other side is reacting that way. And instead of just saying, okay, we had to do this because of the pandemic, we're gonna take a step back and maybe just do, go back to the way we used to do things, slow rollout, maybe a couple changes at a time. Instead, what we did is we're, we said all the changes that we did during the pandemic, we're just gonna make them permanent. And so we end up having one side trying to defend a lot of changes that happened at the same time because they feel like this is protecting democracy. But the other side saying, this is really confusing. I'm not sure what's happening. I keep asking for clarifications and I'm getting kind of muddled answers. And so I think that something nefarious is going on. So unfortunately, because of circumstances, both sides are in a bad position. So I am hoping what we can do, and, and I'm gonna put this in the chat. I also chair the Secretary of State's um, committee. It's, it's the uh, Advisory Committee on Participatory Democracy. And we are having a meeting with Mark Veloshin, who is the secretary, uh, the assistant secretary of state for elections. He's a deputy. And he knows all the laws that just got passed. He knows all the regulations for implementing them. And we're going to do a meeting on March 22nd. It's in the afternoon from two to four. And it's going to live stream through the uh, secretary of state's Facebook page. And what I've asked Mark is to do this. I said, Mark, I'm going to start the meeting and then I'm going to turn the time over to you. No matter how long it takes, please, please walk everyone through all of the changes that are going to happen in this election cycle because of legislation that we passed in the last two legislative sessions. From mail-in voting to automatic voter registration to curing ballots to everything that's, that's changed, I don't care how long it takes, carefully walk through every step of things that we're going to see that are going to be different and how we're making sure that they're secure, how we're, how we're making sure that, that nothing nefarious is happening, and how we can make sure that if somebody gets confused, they know where to ask the question to get good, reliable information, not misinformation. Because we're gonna live stream it through Facebook, 
We're gonna allow people to ask as many questions as they want through the Facebook page. And then when it's done, it will become a recording that's on the Secretary of State's Facebook page. That way, let's say, you know, let's say you're talking to folks about what's happening in Washoe County and people are bringing up the bot drop boxes and are they gonna be secure and who's gonna be gathering them and what's gonna be going on? You would be able to say, you don't have to take my word for it. I know where there's a recording of the gentleman in the Secretary of State's office that handles all of the laws related to this. We can just go on that recording and watch Mark's explanation. And then if we're still having questions, we'll just contact Mark. And then Mark is gonna be able to walk us through how they're gonna be secure and who gets to go pick them up. And so that's something I, I want to do to make sure from the very beginning of our primary that we start to kind of tamp down these wild kind of conspiracies that are going on about what's actually going to happen and that people are not getting information from unreliable sources. But there was just, there was a lot of changes that happened and people are being really emotional. And so, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can do just like we said, you know, was there policy and procedure was followed? Is it legal? Are we actually looking if it's solving a problem? To maybe just model, we're gonna bring the temperature down. Does that help? Does that help at all, I'm hoping? Um, well, I'm certainly looking forward to watching this thing on March 22nd. It does. I just, I know no matter what people like, I would say when I've been at various things, people get passionate, but they don't get ridiculous. I'm, I'm sorry, Unitarians who are there. But, but I don't know if, if there were four hours at the last meeting, even though the res resolution had been pulled, there were four hours of the council uh, just having to be yelled at by people who were promoting, the, the, as far as I'm concerned, um, suppression of voting. So, well, and then, and some that I'm glad you said that because we also need to talk about the role the political parties play in this. Because oftentimes it's, it's one or the other, or maybe both of the political parties that just want to press people's emotion button and do the voter fraud or voter suppression and don't give us a chance to actually have a reasonable discussion like we're having today. And they do that because it's easy to get people all wild up and get them to go and vote for you, but it's wrong. And so there are times where I ask the political parties, can you please be the voice of reason in this and stop spreading misinformation or stop encouraging people to just be emotional? One party right now is refusing to even have those discussions. They just wanna keep promoting conspiracies, but I'm having to talk to the Democrats too and say, you, I need you to model what we should be doing right now. I need you all to be the voice of reason and, and help people walk through a process and, and you know, say, here's actually what the procedure is, or this is what helps us to be secure as opposed to just saying, oh, the other side's bad because they're engaging in voter suppression. Okay, but then help people, help them to understand why that is. And so sometimes it's the political parties that are manipulating things. But again, like Bob said, let's go back to we the people. Maybe we the people don't want that anymore. You know, we, we would like to have democracy be good and sound and people participating and not all this, this screaming, yelling and conspiracy theories. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh, oh, thanks, Leah, uh, for posting the uh, link about the advisory committee. And again, it might be a long meeting, but I've told Mark, take as long as you want to really explain, like, how do we know that people's signatures are correct when they sign the ballot? He's going he's gonna to walk through the machines, the training, what happens if, if you don't trust the signature, what a curing of the ballot is, how you do that. He's going to walk through all of those processes. Uh, just for quick clarification, that link I posted does not have the March 27th meeting uh, link on there. So if you have uh, a link for that meeting or the, you know, where, where it will be live streamed to share. So it's be March fantastic. 22nd. It's 22nd. To, and it's the Secretary of State's uh, Facebook page. Facebook. Okay. I'll take, yeah. I'll take a look for that. Yeah. And uh, so if you just go log on to the Facebook page, um, as soon as we go live, it'll pop up. And then we'll, we'll have somebody, we'll have Jennifer Russell from the Secretary of State's office. She always, she manages or monitors what's on the Facebook page. So people can ask questions right on the Facebook page. And then Jennifer makes sure that I, that she posts over in our chat because we'll be on Zoom so that I see them so that I can ask Mark. But we've, we've budgeted a whole two hours just for to, and, and then Mark's PowerPoint presentation, I will get a copy of it so that I can share it with anybody that wants a copy. 
and it will definitely be on the Vote Nevada um, blog for anybody that wants to have a copy of that. And if you ever have questions about anything, I am going to make you a promise right now. If you email me your question, if I don't know the answer, I will find it out for you. That is fantastic. I put a question in the chat. Um, if, if I don't want to take up anybody else's space, but um, I don't see, I don't see hands. So, oh, sorry. I, I put I put a question in the chat about the Better Voting Nevada Initiative, which is that top five primary ranked choice voting in the general. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and if it sure. solves any of these voter issues? Ah, yes. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm actually involved with two ballot questions. They're both constitutional amendments. One is the redistricting reform ballot initiative. So that's the Fair Maps Nevada. And what we're doing with that is creating an independent redistricting commission, two Democrats, two Republicans, three nonpartisans or non-major uh, party affiliated Nevadans. Right now they have no say. But the main thing we're doing with that is putting redistricting under the open meeting law. Those of you who participated in the special session for redistricting discovered that our legislature exempts itself from the open meeting law. And so they disappear behind closed doors and then come out with maps, won't tell us who drew the maps, won't answer any questions. So the main thing that our ballot initiative would do by making it independent of the legislature, we're allowed to say it must be under the open meeting law. It must follow all the rules of the open meeting law so that they can't do anything behind closed doors. So we're gonna be pushing that again because to me, redistricting and voter suppression go hand in hand. But the, um, the open primary, what we're doing is we are looking at the problem that we were just talking about, political extremism. And what is driving political extremism, especially on the right right now, because it's violent political extremism. On the left, we have people who are engaging in what I would call mobbing. They are taking to the streets, they are protesting. Sometimes we have some property damage, but they're not going to the point where they're threatening people's lives. That goes back in our tradition of mobbing. And what I say to that is these people are frustrated because they don't feel represented. They need to have better representation so they don't feel they have to take to the streets. On the other side, people are threatening people's lives. Our Secretary of State still has to have police protection because she's being threatened. Um, our, our county registrars and clerks are still being threatened. So a bunch of us, when we were looking at states where there's more extremism than others, we started discovering in states where they have open primary that, that you don't have as much extremism because it's easier to vote, get moderates through the process. And so Nevada is a closed primary state. And so if you wanna participate in the primary and, and vote on the top level elections, so we're talking US Senate, Congress, the constitutional office like the governor, the legislature, you have to either be registered Democrat or Republican. If you are looking at um, who is running for the governor on the Republican side right now, it's kind of extreme. I mean, we only have one, and, and I have a problem with just one person running on the Democratic side. We don't have choice. What, we have, what we've looked at in other states where they put everybody on the same ballot, that people are much more likely to vote for the more moderate person, get the more moderate people through. And so that you don't have the, the really people who are very, very extreme getting through the primary process. So what we're proposing is to say um, open primary top five. So for the partisan races at the top, if you have five or fewer people running for that office, whether they're Republicans, independents, libertarians, if it's five people or few, fewer, uh, excuse me, fewer, everybody moves to the general election. This way, you know, Julia might have some really awesome ideas for the things that need to change in the state of Nevada, but she has like $0. If you're going between March when people file for office and June when we do the uh, or yeah June when we do the primary election, she's not going to be able to raise the money that she needs to get her name out there. But if she's in a race where top five are moving forward, she probably is going to get extra time because she's going to move forward into the general election. So we want to have lots of people who have great ideas, but not a lot of money to have time to go on Zooms, to drive out to Elko, to talk to people, to go to churches, so that she can at least get her message out. And, I, and she might may not win, but you know, I'm looking at Kevin thinking, well, Kevin's probably gonna win because he's got backing, he's got experience. But I'm gonna say, Kevin, see what Julia's saying? I want you to do that. So if I vote for you, I need you to promise that you're gonna do what Julia's saying because I think that's an awesome idea. And I've heard her talk about it three or four times. And I think I can get a bunch of other people to vote for you if you're gonna do Julia's idea. So we're trying to make sure good ideas survive over to the general election. 
in the general election, obviously, if you have five people running for U.S. Senate, Congress, House, in our um, legislature, you're going to need to have ranked choice voting in order to make sure the person that has the actual consensus wins. According to the Nevada Constitution right now, people can win an election with a plurality. So technically right now, anybody that runs as a nonpartisan automatically goes to the general election. So let's say I had five college students who run nonpartisan to be the governor. They, they're going to show up on the general election ballot. So you could have seven people running for governor. If you have plur a plurality could win, technically somebody could become governor with 20% of the vote. And that makes me really nervous because I know German history and I know Latin American history. And you don't want somebody winning with 20% of the vote. So instead, what we say is when you vote in those offices, if there's more than one, um, you can just pick one. If you just say, I just want Kevin, I don't like the other people. I just mark Kevin and I'm done. But I also say, uh, I think Kevin's going to win, but I really want to also have had to a vote for Julia. I can say my first vote is going to be Kevin, but my second vote is going to be Julia and then Nancy Ann and then Diane. And then when we calculate the election, if somebody gets 50% plus one, then that person just wins and we're done. But if nobody gets 50% plus one, you know, Nancy Ann got 20%, she's going to drop off. But everybody that did her as her second vote, their votes then go to the people who are remaining. So it's instant runoff without having to have other elections. And we just keep doing that until somebody gets 50% plus one. We know that's the consensus candidate. That's the person that wins. And so it's not, you know, ex extra elections and people don't have to do more than one if they're marking. But it does give you the opportunity, you know, I'm going to say, oh, I really like, you know, Julianne or Julia, but I, I know Kevin's probably going to win. So I'm going to do Kevin and Julie, just in case. Maybe Julie's going to get lots of votes and maybe she's going to get into that instant runoff and she's going to win. We're hoping that that allows Nevadans, the vast majority of us who are very, very moderate and reasonable, are able to vote for the moderate candidates, no matter what their party affiliation is, so that the more extreme folks you know, even if they get, move over to that general election ballot are not going to get the top, you know, three as people are ranking. And so we really see it as a way to bring our nonpartisans in. 37% of all registered voters right now in the state of Nevada are registered nonpartisan or non-major party affiliation. There, there are actually more nonpartisans, non-majors in Clark County than Republicans. So we don't want them shut out. But then we also see it as a way to be able to allow more moderate candidates on either side to be able to be viable to the general election so that moderate candidates will be able to win in the general election. Did, so does that help, Leah? So it has two things. It's, it's open primary and ranked choice voting because we want them to go together because we are we don't want people to win with like 20% of the vote. It does. It's, it's really um, helpful, I think, to explain that to, to folks. Um, like in my legislative district, for example, it's 40% uh, registered Republican, and then the next highest 29% is registered nonpartisan. Right. There's only Republicans running, um, which means that those of us who are not registered as Republican do not get a say in our elected official. And that, you know, it, it kind of hurts. Like I want to, I want to have a vote in who represents me. And, and to do that, that means I have to change up my party affiliation. And it just, you know, it seems like a, an extra step in the process that doesn't need to be there for me anyway. And, I, and actually, I hear that from a lot of rural Democrats, that in many of the races, they don't have a Democrat that runs. It's all Republicans. They get shut out. So they have no say whatsoever. And in the state of Nevada, if somebody gets 50% plus one in the primary, they win. So nobody even that just that one person is going to the general election ballot. So I look at all these Democrats in our rural areas being disenfranchised when that happens. If it's an open primary, everybody's just on a ballot and everybody gets to vote. Uh, oh, the, the process is called ranked choice voting. Do you remember in the 2020 presidential caucuses, if you, if you caucus with the Democrats, in early voting, when we went in and they gave you that piece of paper and you got to rank the candidates, so you got to say maybe Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, um, you know, Julian Castro, that's ranked choice voting. And so that's, that's what the Democrats actually did um, during the caucuses if you voted early. But again, if people don't feel comfortable, you can just do regular voting and I can just say, nope, I just want Kevin, Boop, Kevin, and not have to rank anybody else. Any other questions? 
Uh, well, Sandra, thank you for all of that political support you've just given me. It's too bad I'm not running for Kevin's running. Run, in. run, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the original description of the um, uh, voting uh, uh, ordinance uh, before the uh, county commission, uh, what, one of the provisions with the, was that there should be only one voting machine per pre precinct. Uh, now, I can think of all kinds of challenging questions uh, to ask the proposer, but do you have any idea what's behind that idea? <laughs> um, they're trying, and, and so there's people who don't trust the voting machines because sometimes they think they get connected to the internet and then there can be fraud and stuff. But I don't know how that connects with only having one voting machine. But you know what? I can tell you that that's not going to survive because that, again, violates the... 1965 Voting Rights Act, and it, and it actually violates a bunch of Nevada revised statute. It actually violates law. So I don't even see that as making it go forward. It's not gonna show up in that final ordinance that you guys are gonna be able to do public comment on. Okay, I think Gaia has a uh, question. Gaia, yes. Yeah, you. I know that because I also have gotten the, um, I have a friend who sends me the things that the Republicans are sending out to their people. Right. And um, the, the voting machines were, were only, there was one, um, one per voting place, I think, but it was only for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And so that you, if you didn't have a disability, I don't think you would even be able, you, have, you would have to do a paper ballot. And the reason they had that, uh, with the ADA um, requires that you have a, a machine for oh. people with disabilities. So that was why, they were trying to comply with the law. So what they're saying is they want everybody to fill out a paper ballot, but the law says ADA, ADA compliance means you have to have at least one machine. Yep. That makes sense then. But you know, I can tell you um, when we bought the machines that we have right now, the, the again, Mark Veloshin, who's the, the deputy assistant secretary of state, he regularly goes to meetings to learn about the encryption, you know, how to make sure they're secure, how to make sure they've got the correct updates, how to make sure our voter rolls are secure. And so I'll, I can even ask him on that meeting we do on the 22nd to kind of explain the, the depth that he goes into to make sure those machines are secure. Um, and so I, I like the machines. I prefer the machines. But that makes sense to make sure that they're ADA compliant. But I teach Latin American studies and I teach history of Mexico and history of and Mexican politics has this funny thing that happens where ballots end up in the river all the time. So I have a weird thing about paper ballots. I don't like them. <laughs> Okay, uh, I appreciate you all joining with me today and having this conversation. And I'm going to put my email address over here in the chat. If you hear anything, if you're not quite sure where to go look for like the Nevada revised statute on some of this type of stuff, shoot me an email. And I will help you. Thank you so much for that offer. That is so kind. And um, I, I hope we, we will all check out the votenevadablog.org that you linked in the chat earlier. Um, and is there any other way that we can get involved um, with helping folks who are disenfranchised from voting or just voting rights in general that you can uh, leave us with? So one of the things that, that Vote Nevada is working on is behavioral and mental health, um, especially in the schools because we're having a problem in schools and we don't have enough school psychologists. And this is where Leah and I are usually on meetings together as we're hearing presentations about that. But I can tell you people who, who have mental health problems oftentimes don't vote. That they have so many other things happening in their life, but they do want to vote. They just need someone to say, hey, do you need help? Do you need, we can get you registered. You know, I can show you how to make sure you, you use the machine or get your mail-in ballot. But people who have mental health issues sometimes feel like they are disenfranchised. So, so if you're out there and about, you know, saying, hey, I'm, I'm willing to help, maybe add that in. You know, folks who are, have disabilities or a mental health um, issue that you're willing to help them too. Thank you so much. What a great message. And Kevin, I think you wanted to plug the next uh, Sunday forum before we. Yes, off. yes. Well, uh, Sandra, th um, thank you very much for a wonderful and engaging uh, presentation. Uh, it's it's just what we needed right now. Uh, Yes, uh, the next Sunday forum um, is March 20th, uh, and it is a, um, 
uh, a play actually uh, presented by uh, the UUFNN uh, players uh, uh, starring uh, David Shirey as um, uh, Henry David Thoreau uh, and um, uh, David Bianchi as uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson in a play uh, by Lawrence and Lee called The Night Thoreau Spent in Jail. Now, it might not seem timely to go back to the 19th century, uh, but it is a key piece of uh, Unitarian history, uh, as, uh, as you all know, and it's more timely than you might think because Thoreau was in jail for protesting by refusing to pay his taxes. Uh, the invasion of a smaller neighbor by a more powerful neighbor, namely, the United States invading Mexico. Uh, it was the Mexican-American War. So it is, it is actually timely. Uh, and uh, I think it's helpful to uh, remember uh, what Thoreau's thinking was. Uh, I, I would uh, remind you that uh, Mahatma Gandhi, when he was a young man wandering the streets of London, carried with him Thoreau's uh, essay on civil disobedience. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we probably need to be <laughs> reminded of that uh, seminal essay in American uh, history and literature. So uh, the night Thoreau spent in jail, uh, March 20th, be there. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you again, Sandra, for joining. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking soon. I'm sure I'll see you on another meeting. All right. Thank you, Leah. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone.